All right, I'm just going to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, how's the conference going so far? I missed out in the morning. Good quality. I see a couple thumbs up. People nodding. The free coffee helps, right? <laughs> Good job, Tyler. So, uh, so I'm here to talk to you today about measuring efficacy of real-time intrusion detection systems. So what does that really mean? So I'm here to talk to you today about measuring the efficacy of real-time intrusion detection systems. So what does that really mean? IDS is actually not a new technology, right? People here have heard of SNORT, and I could do a quick Wikipedia, but I'll leave it up for somebody here in the audience to do that. But it's been around for a while. I want to say since at least the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, HoneyNet, HoneyNet Project has been around for a while, too. And so those two specific domains all about looking at network traffic, right? What's going on in the network? And obviously that matters to us because we have information systems that we need to protect. We live in an increasingly connected world. It seems like it took a while for news media to catch on, and a lot of people usually reference Target or even Sony, but since some of those major attacks happen on name brand stores that we take advantage of every day through commerce. Uh, it seems like every couple days on the news, whether it's Reddit, The Register, even The Guardian, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you name it, some venue out there is covering some sort of cyber attack. And nowadays, folks don't even go to media outlets for the insider information or to get notified quickly. They go to Twitter, right? And we follow folks in the field. Uh, one person I tend, uh, happen to follow called Malware Unicorn um, was recently listed as one of the InfoSec professionals to follow. And the reason why I follow her on Twitter was one of her tweets was, hey, uh, on a long flight home, I created a packet analysis uh, coding in Python on a plane. So these are the people that are actually leading the field, right? And these are the people to pay attention to. And why is that? Because these technologies that have been around for a little while may not necessarily be keeping up to date with the evolution of attacks. Why is that? Data. Everyone's heard the term of big data before. And what does it mean? Data is context-based, right? So in other words, the value of the information you have from the data depends on how you look at it and what's important for you, and of course, how you analyze it. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today and the application of machine learning techniques to data to better detect, analyze, and ultimately prevent network-based attacks. This is important because it's no secret that there's a shortage of information security professionals out there. And even if you were to throw a whole bunch of people at the problem, which is great because then there's jobs and uh, you know salaries increase as well, right, based on demand, it's a market solution. We all know that attackers out there are becoming increasingly automated. Right, uh, I would argue that attacks uh, nowadays don't really happen in isolated pockets. They obviously do. But increasingly, we're seeing patterns of automation and an assembly line approach to cyber attacks. And so as cybersecurity professionals, our job is to try to analyze the data and come up with actual intelligence as quickly as possible and in a relevant manner so that we can better protect the business. So a little bit about myself. I do not consider myself to be a programmer, though I'm familiar with scripting technologies. My bread and butter is to be presented with a business problem and then solve it. I'm that guy that figures stuff out. How many of you in here are, is that person? I would argue that everyone is that person in this room. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here at this conference. I'm just lucky that you happen to come into my talk. But the reality is, and this is how I view information technology and securing information systems. It's kind of like a game, like a board game. If you ever sit down and try to play a game, uh, I picked up Scythe on Kickstarter. It's a great game. If you haven't heard of it, look it up. Uh, and when you first look at this board game or any board game, you see the board, the way it's laid out, some of the artwork, maybe some colors, and then you start to think about it. Like, what's the objective of this game? What are the pieces involved? Uh, what are the mechanics? 
right? And then you play the game once, you get your butt kicked, right? And you're like, oh, that was kind of rough. I kind of don't get it. But then you play the game a second time and a third time, and it starts to click. It starts to make sense. You start to see uh, maybe how you lost and why you lost. Maybe you start to strategize a little bit. And before long, through practice, you start to become an expert in that system. In my opinion, this applies to my approach to informa information technology and how most people approach information technology. But the tricky part is, because of data, how do we do so in a manner where we can react quickly to the emerging threats that exist out there and the state of change? So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently the Chief Information Security Officer for the Department of Financial Services, a state government agency. Uh, has anybody here had experience in a state government agency or currently works for one or ever contracted with one? How uh, quickly do they adopt to change? <laughs> Never is pretty accurate. <laughs> so uh, DFS has been on the news lately for passing a reg um, requiring regulated financial entities to have a dedicated security program. And one thing that they realize is that the house needs to have one as well. And so that's what I got hired to do. And so being that they're a government agency, they're not in the forefront of security and not actively looking at project, uh, products out there and the trends about what's happening. And so with 16 years of IT experience, 10 years in InfoSec, for a number of local companies, it's only recently that I went to New York City, um, I've had my finger on the pulse. And so when I was at University of Albany, I applied for the PhD program and I had a very specific research idea in mind. And this presentation and paper that I wrote uh, is about this research idea. So a little bit of background. So we're concerned with the confidentiality, integrity, uh, and authorization slash authentication of network communications. So making sure that information systems that exist in a business are available, function as expected, and of course, with IDS technologies, right, understand, detect, uh, record any attempts to circumvent controls, right? So some businesses, especially with government agencies, may or may not have a policy in place. Fortunately, there's an enterprise ISO office and they have a slew of policies. So that becomes a starting point. From there, you develop uh, standards, procedures, and you bake that into a technology to uh, derive value, right? Because it's an investment. Typically, IT is a cost center, so we want to maximize that investment. In other words, IT isn't cheap, especially when you're paying for support or contractors. And obviously, we know that firewalls work pretty well. Um, Checkpoint has a wonderful firewall system. I'm familiar with that because I used to administer it for the Public Service Commission. They even make it so simple. There's a GUI. I don't have to uh, play around on the command line like I used to do uh, back in my Albany Med days where everything was just one line scripts and you would feed it through. So as things have changed over time and we have wonderful GUI systems, that also means that if you have port 80 open for web traffic and communication, obviously that could be a potential exfiltration point. How many of you are actively monitoring web communications? All right, and so we typically rely on a managed service provider to do that for us. But if someone were browsing the web for, say, source fire, and an activity occurred where the ONU is switched, it's no longer source fire, right? Uh, that could potentially bring you to a different web server. Would you be able to detect that? And would you be able to respond? So the reason why I bring that up is because of the final bullet, context-aware computing. So the ability to discover and detect changes in the environment, and I would say unexpected changes in the environment. So you probably have a, a background on this, and there's a lot of text on this slide, but we're concerned with network protocols, right? TCP, specific sequence network communications, redundancy, checksums, um, user datagrams. We don't really care about the data being sent uh, out and back to us in the order, right? Video streams, things of that nature. And of course, ICMP. I frequently find in environments where uh, I've been an administrator in, security administrator, that ICMP is often not configured to be uh, either rejected or controlled in a specific manner. So ICMP is more than just a packet. Most people are familiar with that from a ping perspective. But it's actually an entire protocol suite 
that uh, could potentially be abused and often is. So for this particular research idea, I want to look at these three protocols. So more definitions and background. Intrusion detection, we already spoke about that a little bit, detecting actions that compromise uh, CIA of a resource, right? And uh, most importantly, detect actions that attempt to subvert. So that's good, but that's only half the pie, right? And so let me know if this situation scenario is familiar. You're at a company, and they know that having IDS be able to detect stuff on the network is a great idea. So they go through a list of vendors, right? And maybe they're going through several vendors and have some interesting um, demos and dog and pony shows. And after listening to how they describe the wares and how the offerings will work in their environment, they end up management, executive management, ends up making a choice based on the cheapest priced, supposedly 24 by 7 availability of support, supposedly ease of use, because the demo always works, right? And of course, the best company t-shirt design. Who here, whenever you see the Splunk booth, always runs for the free t-shirt? Pretty good, right? Marketing works. <laughs> so finally, the company picks uh, an appliance, a vendor, whatever. And so the question is, what now? What do you do with that? Can you set it and forget it? Oftentimes, the company will simply outsource it, because that's the easy answer. So what if, what if there's more to it? And how do you even know that the chosen IDS partner is effective? So four main areas uh, that I have found in my personal work experience tend to be overlooked. So a policy that actually dictates effective monitoring and response. So are you actively looking at the uh, traffic? What do you do when you see something interesting? How do you prioritize that and respond appropriately? Is there a definition of an incident? And once that threshold has been reached, how do you act on that? Assuming that you've defined what an incident is and are taking steps to handle it, what's the forensic analysis and data retention? How's it being handled? And of course, reporting. How useful is the information, right? Are you just simply getting an alert in a mailbox? No joke, I used to work at a company that uh, I was added to a mailbox and I would always get alerts that a system was down. And I was like, wow, this seems like a big deal. And I would look around the room, I'm like, why, isn't, why aren't the systems people running around like chickens with their head cut off? It was actually really puzzling. So I simply asked a question. Like, oh yeah, it does that. What do you mean it does that? Yeah, our server monitoring just kind of sends out pings and like, whatever. So I'm like, so how do you know if it's real or not? Well, if the users call and complain. Literally, that was their answer. I won't disclose who I was working for when that happened, but that's a true story. So why did it go that way? It turns out that they didn't train their people. So there wasn't people dedicated to actually tuning the, the appliance. And I don't think that's unusual. I think a lot of organizations do not actively invest enough in training for folks to actively realize the value of the systems they put in place. Literally set it and forget it. So what are the different types out there? Uh, Network-based, this is what this talk is going to focus on. Um, but there are others out there, some that reside on a host, an agent that's configured. Um, we have some examples up there. And also, you have physical systems as well. Often, we'll kind of take that for granted. Anybody here have an ID card you just hold up to a door? Right? Anybody staying in a hotel room tonight? Right? All examples. Even your uh, wireless key entry for your car. But oftentimes, and maybe the car is a bad example in that regard, um, oftentimes those systems have monitoring in place, right, to detect unauthorized attempts. I can't tell you any place that I've worked at where they actively looked at locks to see, hey, is there a regular instance of people trying this door or trying a key? Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, a place that I've worked at before, name withheld, had office services that set up cards, and I'm convinced they didn't even um, ask for the cards back. I know this because I still have my card. So you can't just set up the system. There has to be follow through. And so what's the next step beyond detection? Obviously prevention. So if we're talking about network-based attacks, and network-based 
intrusion detection. The next step would be intrusion prevention. So, hey, we detected uh, an attempt at an intrusion or compromise. Uh, let's prevent it from actually affecting the host. And of course, log it. So with some best practices for this information, the monitoring is a big piece of effective incident handling. You have to determine who's monitoring the systems. Is it internal or external? If it is external people doing the brunt of the work, is there a relationship with folks on the inside, internally? Is there communication set up? Are emails being sent but being ignored? And of course, what will you do once you get the alert? And who's going to fix a vulnerability? It's not good enough to simply be alerted. There has to be a process and a flow that's cyclical that handles this. Note that these bullets are in lists. This type of linear thinking in and of itself would actually get you in trouble. And I'll talk about that in a couple slides. And unfortunately, that's where the buck stops. Because why bother detecting an attack in the first place if there's not going to be anything done about it? It's not even good enough just to mitigate the vulnerability. How do you learn from it so that it's not uh, an action that's repeated, so you're not wasting time and resources? I don't know if any of you are aware, but time is not a renewable resource. And if you figure out how to make that renewable, you'll be rich. Let's talk. So it's important to know, or rather to determine how an incident happened, establish a process to avoid further exploitations, understand how to uh, escalate, and of course, avoid further incidents, assess impact and damage, and of course, recover appropriately. And finally, update procedures as needed. How many of you walked into a workplace and asked to see a knowledge base article and uh, saw that maybe they were four or five years outdated? Anybody work into a support area? And they're like, yeah, we, we don't really know how to help people when they're out in the field, so we kind of give them the admin password. It happens. And so if that happens, how do you effectively detect if someone's doing a uh, privilege escalation or for a regular end user is logging into um, a local machine and, and abusing it? You can at that point. Okay, good. So how do you deal with this all? It's important to have an effective security incident response, ideally in a team, right? Where there's a team response, dedicated people who are not only analyzing the data, but are building those relationships. Active documentation, meaning that there's a minimum quarterly review. Why quarterly? Because it keeps everyone on the same page as people leave the organization and come into the organization. Oftentimes, I see that information management is very tribal. Maybe you have a really awesome manager that says, you know what? You guys just came on board. I'm going to have you sit with my senior people over here, and you're going to learn all the cool things. That doesn't happen as often as it could be. Usually, it's like, hey, here's your desk. Figure it out. It's also important to have incident coordination so that when people are, multiple people are trying to make an interpretation of policy, standards, and procedures, there's uniform application to an incident. Obviously, for forensic purposes, preservation of data is super important. And uh, ultimately, this comes through experience. You have effective prioritization of a response, and you're aware of both internal contacts and external contacts. Last week, I was in a New York State uh, cybersecurity conference. Any of you attend that as well? A handful of you? Iffy? <laughs> it was actually really solid this year. And I've attended the past three years, and I don't say that every year. I'll just say that up front. This year, the focus was actually quite interesting. Uh, I attended a presentation that stated that incident response is actually only 50% IT. The other half is a business. That starts to make sense when you start to think about, OK, if there's an incident and you find that a data breach has occurred, who do you contact first? Your office of general counsel? Your public information officer? How do you contact them? How do you deliver that information? Are they going to know what you're talking about? Are they going to take you seriously? Maybe they start freaking out. Oh my god, this is crazy. Well, yeah, they got the USB key, but it's encrypted. Do they understand that? Right? That there was a control in place? So 
Um, and of course, can you tell them specifically how it happens to prevent it in the future? So this is all part of an effective security incident response. So let's get a little bit more, so that's pretty much all background. Let's get a little bit more into the, the nuts and the bolts, nuts and the bolts here. So there's two main detection techniques. These are academic terms, right? Misuse and anomaly. But really, we know them as rule-based or heuristic-based, right? Rule-based, we know what it is. And so we have a signature that can detect it, and we're good. Antivirus software works that way. Auto updates all the time. Anomaly-based isn't quite machine learning. It's just looking at patterns of behavior, right? Like, OK, given a set of executables on your machine, is one example. Um, let's detect for buffer overflows, right? If data is being inserted uh, before or after a boundary, right? This is not a machine learning technique, but it's a heuristic looking at behavior. So those are the two main technologies. They've actually been around for a while. But the interesting thing is they depend largely on the people who are uh, developing those technologies. There's no substitute for the human mind, but recall that early on in this presentation, one of the problems that we have is a lack of um, trained cybersecurity personnel, and that need is only going to continue to grow. Whoops, no more. So try to make the text a little bit big here. But this slide is actually kind of important. And I actually grabbed it from uh, a blog when doing some research, and it really stuck with me. It stuck with me because Oftentimes, we actually think in lists, right? I have my to-do list over here. I've got my system implementation over here. Sometimes it'll be a little bit different. Maybe in the course of an implementation, you'll have maybe a Gantt chart. Perhaps it was put together by a project manager. Hopefully, you had some input into that. Or an implementation schedule. But attackers are a unique breed in their way of thinking. And I would argue, and machine learning does this as well, depending on the algorithm. I'll talk about that in a couple more slides. Graphs, defending graphs is important. And I don't mean graphs like a chart in PowerPoint. I don't have a chart here. I'm thinking more like graphs, the intersection of multiple points, right? So here's an example. So an attacker is much more likely to attempt to attack a domain controller associated with a workstation that's already been compromised and rather than one that's in an off-network segment. So if you have a remote access trojan, or maybe simply a keylogger, over time, you just start to collect the data, right? And then you don't do anything with it for a little while. It just siphons it off and sends it your way. But then an attacker will start to look at that data and will look for the interesting nuggets, right? An even better example or simpler example is if you have perhaps a single terminal server with hundreds of users, a terminal server in and of itself isn't going to give you a ton of access in the network. But if you start to be able to record and actively collect credentials on that terminal server, you have a gold mine. All it takes is one privileged account, and you're good to go. And so that's, that's not a new situation, right? Because they're just simply sitting and waiting and then leveraging uh, privilege escalation to go to the next step. But the reason why it's important to make this point is attackers don't initially know what they're going for. I mean, they know what their end goal is, right? To compromise the network, siphon the data, perhaps sell in the black market, or embarrass the company you're working for, for whatever reason. Bragging rights, hacktivism, you name it. But the reality is they're looking for any opportunity. They don't have a list of prioritization, right? They're just going to try some things out and see what works. But they're very disciplined in that approach, so they're not random. So I honestly can't take credit for this quote, but I was browsing the web and I couldn't find out uh, where it is. But the point here is, with all that's going on, it is super important to automate as often and as much as realistically possible to have the computers do the work for you, right? Uh, who here has used the lazy sysadmin website? Or any website when you're looking for scripts? Bash, PowerShell. I feel like if you have some sysadmin experience, your hand's going to go up, even if it's a little bit like this. Feel free to grab coffee, it's free. But I wanted to make this point because oftentimes 
an organization executives who, who don't have a, a mind for this stuff, and I'm not saying that to be insulting, I'm saying that their priority is somewhere else on the business, right? So it's up to ourselves as technical professionals, whether we're the consultants ourselves or working in that shop to make this point, that it's worth the investment and worth uh, tuning that investment so that we realize that value. Uh, let's see. So, lit stands for literature review. I know this is Amanda's favorite word. So, how do we measure efficacy, right? Measure is a key word. So, in the application of testing something out, right, we need something that's a standard. The knowledge, uh, knowledge data, Oh, Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining Conference, an international conference back in 1999, yes, that's 18 years ago, in conjunction with the U.S. Air Force, simulated network attacks over a nine-week period and generated over 7 million events. And not only did they generate all that traffic, all that traffic, every single packet and every TCP stream is tagged and documented for what's considered normal, and what is simulating an attack. So what that does is it creates a baseline. Super helpful. Now, there's some issues with that. I'll talk, to you, I'll talk a little about that in a couple slides. The glaring part is obviously what happened in 1999 does not reflect what's happening now in 2017. But it's still super useful. And there's four main categories that this data set falls into. So when coming up with a new technology, in understanding whether or not it actually has a positive impact, you have to be able to measure it. So this provides us a baseline in the standard to do that. So obviously we're looking at denial of service, unauthorized access, either from a remote machine or through privilege escalation, um, and also the types of attacks, such as buffer overflow, and uh, probing, whether it's uh, scanning a service on a machine or scanning an entire subnet. So it is actually the current standard, believe it or not, because there's nothing newer to replace it. So someone needs to make a phone call to an Air Force general. I think they have the Air Force uh, Research Lab over in Utica. They came to the conference last week at cybersecurity, uh, so we should have uh, had that conversation. Hey, guys, let's update the stuff. The data set collection, so we have, so I mentioned a couple of attacks earlier, four main categories, but there's uh, 39 overall different types of attacks, but 22 are focused in a particular data set um, over seven of the nine weeks. So in other words, you want to look at seven out of nine weeks worth of attacks to standardize and see if you can catch them. And then there's two weeks of that subset that is randomized. So that provides the um, dependent variable for the independent variable. There's also 41 uh, different types of attributes. So like I mentioned, they're all tagged. So why use it even though it's 18 years old? Simple, standard, and you can measure it. But there are problems. Some features actually have no relevance in intrusion detection today. Uh, for instance, most people would say, hey, we don't use FTP. Anybody here using FTP? Maybe you are. Don't, it's all right, you don't, want, you don't have to like out yourself if you don't want to say that. But most people are probably using SCP or SFTP. That's my point. Anybody using Telnet? I hope not, because uh, New York State Enterprise uh, Information Security Office said uh, if Telnet was enabled on Cisco equipment, even though they had a patch out, um, you were vulnerable to an attack last month. Um, but you shouldn't have Telnet av uh, available anyway, right? Because everything happens in plain text. But you guys already know this. So some, my point is some of this information is included in that data set that we would just say, you know what? We have a policy in place, no telnet in our environment, no FTP in our environment. Everything's using either a uh, secure channel, certificates, IPsec, whatever. Um, and of course, uh, some of the features that they have there, like number of file creation operations, you probably don't care that a file is being created, right? You, what you care about is to detect that unauthorized intrusion before a file was created, um, whether that's... Um, an executable being unloaded, or uh, data being accessed, or whatever. And also, some features have grown in sophistication and aren't being used anymore. So apparently, they featured a piece of malware called 
where's master, W-A-R-E-Z, and where's client. I can't think of anything in the recent past that has featured that type of exploit. Can you? Obviously, some of the problems with something 18 years old. So it would benefit from, from a serious update. Also, Nmap. So they actually have Nmap scans. So Nmap was being used in this data set in 1999. Give it up for Nmap. And I don't know if you saw that on Twitter. They recently updated it um, in time for the Summer of Code, right? And they were proud of themselves because uh, it was in time for DEF CON. Um, so people can play around with it. I love Nmap. And what wasn't around in 1999 that is now is Nmap's uh, TCP IP fingerprinting technologies and techniques, which have been around for a while, but not 18 years ago. And of course, the Nmap scripting engine. And would modern uh, IDSs, IPSs be able to detect that? I don't know. Maybe, but it's tough to know for sure without a standard data set that you can measure. And so I use it at all. It's because data classification matters. Um, so ideally, have online and offline network intrusion detection. We'll just assume all online. Ideally, what we're looking to do is detect misuse and anomalies in the network traffic. With the tags, you can actually map those, map those attempts. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning. So a little bit of background. The algorithm that you use matters, right? And the approach to the data that you use matters. Um, you have Monte Carlo simulations. You have decision trees. You have supervised learning where people are looking at the results of the algorithm being applied and then tweaking it accordingly. You have unsupervised learning where you just let the machine figure it out, right? And uh, you know, good real world examples are anybody watch any YouTube videos of Google's DeepMind project beating a Go champion, uh, I think in the past three months? It was a ch young Chinese person, I think he's 19 years old, I forget his name. And uh, he ex was expected to win, and that didn't happen. And notice this trend over time, right? In the late 90s, it was uh, IBM's Deep Blue that won chess, right? And I forget the number of combinations of moves in chess. It's something like in the order of millions. But I know Go is literally an order of uh, billions, so infinitely more complex uh, than chess. And so in our lifetime, this is actually an important point. In our lifetime, they did not expect artificial intelligence to master a game like Go. But that happened. And that happened in, uh, two years ago when they were proving it out, and it happened more recently. Um, I think in January of this year with the Go Champion. So there's a benefit here. There's a huge benefit here to understand what's going on in the network and prevent the bad guys from getting in. So here's an example of one technique called information game. I have this example because this is the one that I want to start with. There's a reason why. The data doesn't decrease over time. It increases all day, every day. Um, not so oversimplification, but there's actually a mathematical formula. Uh, do you guys remember? Because you were in the class B4412 last fall. Uh, Ethernet, right? So if you were to scan a, or retain data from a 100 megabit port for 30 days, how many gigs of space did you need? Do you remember? I don't. I should have looked at my notes before that. And that's one. Well, I think one port is uh, in the neighborhood of gigabytes, but an entire network is in the neighborhood of terabytes. So if you're, and that's not even a large network. We're talking probably small to mid-sized business. If they were to retain just 30 days of network data, they would literally need terabytes of free space today. It's um, the example that I'm that I don't remember off the top of my head, comes from the Network Security Onion book published by um, No Starch Press. Highly recommend that book. It's awesome. And it actually gives you a great introduction to uh, IDS IPS technology because the distribution, Network Security Onion, is free. And not only can you set it up in a lab environment, but I encourage you to play with it because it has Python baked into it. You can apply machine learning techniques. And you can also set up sensors on the network and forward it to a central server. So uh, it's a free plug for that book. 
uh, but it's worth your time to check it out if you haven't been exposed to it before. And so the reason for this particular uh, algorithm is to look at data over time as the information set increases and continually look at patterns. So the goal is to determine how relevant each network feature, network communication, uh, network port um, is when used in conjunction with data classification. So that implies that you would actually set a series of rules, kind of like, okay, we know this is going to be okay. Uh, we're okay with web traffic out on port 80 as one example. Um, so note, it's not a substitute for web filtering. Um, but the goal is to determine, okay, we know we see web traffic being browsed from our end user network, but maybe one day the system will catch web surfing traffic or an attempt to connect to a domain over port 80 uh, from a server that hasn't done so before in the past 30 days. So as a best practice, a system admin shouldn't be serving, uh, shouldn't be browsing the web from an application server. That could happen. Maybe he forgot between the remote sessions or Maybe it's an attempt at a compromise. Who knows? An IDS system today may not actually catch that unless you were to build some sort of uh, rule in place to do it specifically. Here, what I'm advocating for is that the technology learns and says, this is abnormal behavior. I haven't seen this before. Snag it and alert. As you build confidence with the system, you flip the switch to prevent. And so we take what, what was created with the KDD set and build your own template for a list of attacks and apply the machine learning techniques to the data classification. And so I frame this in the form of a research question because like I started this presentation before, this is an idea for uh, my PhD, which I suspended to get this wonderful job opportunity in New York City, but I hope to continue one day. So given the model for information gain, can we determine the efficacy today using the KDD99 set, and can we apply it in the future? And so I'm looking at three different methods. Can we det detect the DDoS attack? Uh, can we detect standard usage of the Metasploit framework, right, using modern day vulnerabilities, because we know that using data from 18 years ago might give us a baseline, but is inadequate. And ultimately, can we look at uh, 12 different variables in a packet header and determine if techniques are being used that abuse, um, whether it's, that abuse the network, whether it's firewalking, uh, whether it's uh, port scanning, things of that nature. And of course, there's certain key metrics to look for because we've got to make sure that not only is it effective in analyzing data, but that the system is reliable. So looking at things such as network performance, whether or not it's dropping packets, CPU memory utilization, things of that nature. There's no point designing a system that isn't reliable. And so for those of you that spend a lot of time doing uh, data analysis, uh, TCP dumps, things of that nature, this isn't new for you. But this is a visualization of a packet and uh, each of the components as they're built. And so ideally the system would look for each one. And that's possible because uh, at least with uh, the IP protocol suite, TCP, UDP, and ICMP, uh, thanks to the RFCs that exist out there, um, everything is standardized. How, does, how do we go from a communication here over to um, France? Well. We can do that because the network communication follows a standard, right? The ISO reference model, things of that nature in the RFC. Anybody here actually read any of the RFCs? Handful of you. I would expect this row to raise their hands because it was assigned reading in, in fall. Uh, anyone want to take a guess the year that uh, TCP was released as a, as a standard? Excuse me? 1984? I actually don't know the answer off my head. But I know it was in the early 80s. <laughs> but that surprises people. Because people are like, nah, the internet happened in the 90s. And no, nah, networking was happening prior to that. Um, and even uh, before email was a system, they created the protocol SMTP to send messages. 
Email as a system came after SMTP. SMTP, the ability to send a message, was literally just a message, like on your screen, uh, prior to the email system. And that uh, also predates the 90s. There's a reason why I bring that up. I encourage you to do, it's freely available, it's actually just text files, there's a library out there that IETF uh, publishes. Take a look at some of these RFCs. There's some good technical information in there. And the reason why I mention that is because in those RFCs are rules for how data communications occur. So if you know the rules of a system, right, going back to the game mentality, what can you do? You can start to maybe play with those rules, right? Maybe see where things can be meant. Maybe see how a system expects a communication to arrive and how a system expects to receive it and of course how they expect to send it. And that's how you manipulate it, right? So anybody knows that, well, I, should, I shouldn't take that for granted, I'll take a step back. Who here has ever used a command line to send an email message and actually type the SMTP commands? A couple hands, cool. I remember when I first did that, it actually kind of blew my mind away because I took for granted the fact that I would use an email client, a piece of software that did it for me automatically. Big fan of Pine in the Unix system. Um, and when I uh, did this simple exercise, probably 2000, 2001, um, way back in the day, were you guys even born that? <laughs> Some eyebrows raised. Um, it blew my mind that this is what actually happens behind the scenes. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. Nowadays, everything is a screen. Everything is a presentation, right? So what happens underneath that presentation in the layers is super important. And I would argue for the audience here, most of you are very comfortable getting in the weeds. But I think as newer generations of InfoSec professionals come up through the ranks, it's increasingly important to encourage them to have that kind of exposure, right? So be, this is a hacker conference. Any of you visiting the hacking lab today? Today or tomorrow? All right, I see a couple hands. I'll be honest, I expected a couple more hands to come up. If you didn't have a plan to go there, go there. And just ask somebody, have a conversation. Hey, mind if I check out what you're doing over here? And just see how they're manipulating the data in the command line. Because that sets you up for success, not only to understand what's happening uh, behind that presentation layer, but to understand how the systems are interacting. So we'll drive a little bit deeper. So we saw this is a visual representation of the TCP packet. Here's the actual data points. And so these are bits. And so it, there's basically uh, a numerical rule set that creates these boundaries. So these boundaries are for us as human beings to read this stuff and make sense of it. Um, but it's literally bits, zeros and ones. And it knows because of the RFC where the boundaries start, where the boundaries end, and how to make sense of it. Source port, where the traffic's going. Um, oh no, source port, where the traffic started, destination port, where it's going. The sequence number, important for TCP, things of that nature. So the goal, I'll move forward for a little bit, is to look at these 12 variables, these components in the TCP packet, to see how the TCP data stream, which is a conversation from start to finish, occurs, and if there's any abuse happening between the line. And if it can learn this with a high degree of confidence and a low enough error rate, have it take action on your behalf. And of course, log it, present it to you, things of that nature. So once again, uh, Wikipedia is a great resource. Actually, probably half the definitions, probably half the presentation actually came from Wikipedia, just being honest. Um, but it's a great resource for this stuff. I'll also plug YouTube. How many YouTube videos have I assigned in classes at UAlbany? And they're pretty solid. Yeah, begrudgingly, yeah, it kind of was. Well, guess what? To be an InfoSec professional today, you don't need to, University of Albany probably isn't going to like this, you don't need to actually pay for a very expensive education. You just have to have the drive, the desire, and expose yourself to the technologies out there. Udemy is a great resource. Now, you won't get a four-year degree from Udemy.com. But they have experts in data mining, data visualization, hacking, programming, Linux. You get the idea here. And some of these courses you can pay for 10, 50 bucks at a pop. And they have that trust system, right? 7,000 people rated 
course XYZ, Python machine learning, four and a half stars. All right, maybe I'll learn something here. Take my 10 bucks. And if you dedicate six weeks of your life, you'll probably learn a thing or two. And the reason why that's an important thing to say is because in places like the Ukraine, Estonia, or parts of Brazil, right, where people might have access to maybe a computer that's 10 years old but can still function, and there may not be a lot of job prospects, but they love this stuff because it's fun and it's a game for them and they like to learn, um, they'll use the community, the internet community, to help each other out. Um, I still remember when I went to IRC back in the day, I don't know if there's a statute of limitations in digital piracy, but let's just say I got very comfortable in finding uh, anime uh, back in my UAlbany days. And that was my first exposure to IRC. And then from there, uh, I got more exposure to script kitties and techniques that were being passed around for free. All you had to do was ask some questions, jump on some channels, and that was it. So back to the topic at hand, people out there are becoming increasingly better equipped to scan and attack our networks. And so using uh, an effective algorithm and looking at specific key variables in a packet, I don't know how well this looks, um, allows you to build a system. This is a network diagram for a potential system that starts with an ethernet port at the top. And now there's a boundary for um, online data. And you have a pre-processing phase where you sniff the packets extract the IP features, look at TCP, bless you, look at TCP, UDP, and ICMP packets. Why those three packets? Because of the RFC. There's a different rule set at looking at those packets. Um, you collect all that data and parse it, and um, separate the data in records to be analyzed to look for those 12 features, those 12 key variables. So that's at the end of the pre-processing phase. Once you've done that, and then you move on to the next step, which is classification. So I'm looking at all these packets and have the entire conversation, the TCP stream, where does it fit? Is this normal traffic? Is this a scan? Is this a particular attack vector? Whoops, well, that was too fast. Uh, I try to scroll down and it just advances the slides. Um, and of course, once it does a data classification, um, run the algorithm to learn over time, um, log it, and then you have the post-processing phase where over time it starts to, that little box that's cut over in the bottom. There, that's my pointer right there. Um, starts to rate the confidence, right? Um, because the idea is, at least when the system is first designed, you're gonna have to help it move along, as with any system. I have still yet to run into a piece of technology that works straight up out of the box. Even this Dell computer that I'm using, I didn't get paid to say that, uh, came with you know, bloatware I didn't want. I also had to configure Windows, so it wasn't giving out all my crap you know, with Cortana. I don't need your Cortana. I like that you're there, but no, um, et cetera. So the concept still applies even here. Because as you look at the data streams and classify it, you want to build your confidence with it. And so why does it matter? So I'll say this, and you guys will be like, oh, why did you wait until 48 minutes in to say this? This idea or this concept isn't super new. Anybody here heard of Silence? All right. Anybody here heard of Veronis? Veronis looks at unstructured data in your network, helps do auditing, things of that nature. Um, they also have a BCP product that they're plugging out. I don't know too much about it. Silence is probably closely aligned to what I'm talking about here. Here's the deal, though. Silence is an enterprise product, right? You buy the appliance, it's a virtual machine, sits on your network, looks at all this stuff, and you know, looks at the data and makes intelligent decisions. How many of you have the budget of an enterprise organization? I saw two hands, sweet. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> so you might be able to afford Silence and it might work great. Um, and they keep, and this is what I love about the product actually, they keep bringing it to hacker conferences and encourage people to hack against it to make their systems smarter. That's effing brilliant, because people are like, yeah, I'll do the challenge, and they're basically training their system for free. How many of you have a smartphone? Pretty much everybody, right? And even your mother, maybe your grandmother has one now, right? You've been like, get rid of the flip phone, go to the iPhone, we can do the FaceTime, and now you became their ad hoc tech support. 
Are there any products that exist out there for stuff like this for you and me? For grandma? Who might fall for that phishing email or uh, that website that says, hey, pay, pay your NIMO bill for $250, and if you don't, I'm going to cut it off? Now, we know that happens sometimes in phone calls and stuff like that, but it does happen in emails as well. So my point is, you and me, the average Joe person, who doesn't have the budget of the two hands that are raised in the room, do not have access to stuff like this. I would love to see a product like this available for the average Joe user that would actually learn and get smarter and better over time. By the way, and I want to make it a point about privacy, the KD99 data set is anonymized. So if a product like this were to be developed and commercialized, maybe one day that'll happen for me. I don't know where my future and my path will take me. Um, but yeah, I would totally write that into the privacy policy and say, yep, your data is anonymized. I just want the system to learn smarter. Um, there's enough big government out there and big uh, industry, right? Especially now knowing that our search histories can be sold, right, for data. How many of you got a VPN subscription once uh, that law was passed? Yeah, I'm trying one out for free. Yeah, yeah, I don't trust it either. I don't think I have anything to hide, but you never know. Um, so anyway, I guess that's about it. So that's my contribution. I love to present uh, something like this awesome for the average Joe person because antivirus and uh, malware detection is pretty good, but it's not going to cut it over time. So thank you. And I'm sorry if I bored you in the first half, but I always like to start with definitions and a build-up to get to you know the meat. I don't want to lose anybody in the process. Uh, any questions? That's a great question. I actually don't act, do not actively play with existing technologies now. I do know that I, there's probably a lot of Splunk users in the room ish. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Splunk, and it actually has to be tuned. So Splunk lets you build uh, obviously the intake right and helps you standardize that intake. But I found that it's very clunky to use, and you can actually tag a lot of the data and build dashboards. So basically. It's not machine learning, because Splunk isn't getting smarter over time. But it makes it easier for guys like you and me to look at that data. And so, yeah, I, I detect something weird here, because it matches the dashboard rule, right? Maybe it's SSH probing, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's firewalking. Is there uh, an IP address doing sequential scanning? You know, things like that. So is there an off-the-shelf product that does that now? Uh, I, I don't know. Once they're in the system, is that what you said? Interactively using an exploit? Huh. Then I would say make. F gotcha. Then I would say make friends here in the conference or maybe one of the vendors uh, to have an instant response team contact, and that's valid. And I encourage that as part of the playbook, because not only is it important to have your team trained and to tune any appliances you may bring in or technologies you're using now, it's also important to communicate internally, but also to have those relationships in case an instant response is necessary that may be outside the realm of what the org or the team can handle. And I hear Verizon has a pretty good team. They only put out that report once a year. So, <laughs> Any other questions or even comments? I wish I had something off you like free beer or ice cream. But once again, there's free coffee. Everyone, thanks for your time. I appreciate you being here. This is great.